Greetings everyone. Good evening from Election Day 2024. In the United States right now, we are starting to wind up the actual voting process and starting to commence the frantic counting process. And along with that is all kinds of possibilities for political chaos, for unrest, potentially for Concord. I've, on my blog and elsewhere, I've written about some of the short-term possibilities, especially for political unrest. And those are very close to my mind right now. Uh, I, I voted this morning and things went very well and very smoothly. Uh, but of course, I'm paying attention to all the signs of uh, tension around election sites, of uh, violence, such as it is, and of course, the possibilities for lawfare not to mention for active politicking, but what I want to do right now in this blog is just share some of my thoughts about the big picture, what I think this election embodies, and where it might take us in the medium to long-term future. Now, these are notes <laughs> scrawled at the end of a very long day, um, so they're not in any particular order. Um, this is considered, you know, consider this kind of a, a notebook vlog um, but each of these involves a very very large topic it's by no means exhaustive uh, these points are just the ones that I found most salient right now uh, but there are of course others uh, so to begin with uh, just thinking about where this election might take us if we look out say four years one of the interesting points of this is there's some degree of continuity between both Trump and Harris in terms of our China policy, that is, we've seen three presidencies, the Biden administration, the Obama administration, and the Trump administration, each position the United States globally against China. Yes, in, in different ways, through different techniques, through technological investment, through assembling a trade coalition, by assembling a military coalition, through considering tariffs. But the key thing here is repositioning American policy against China. And it looks like both Harris and Trump want to continue that. Again, through different ways. We don't have a lot of information that's reliable about both, uh, partly because Harris is a very recent candidate and has been relatively reticent with the press, and for Trump, because, of course, he's a chaos monkey, he's very random. Uh, but it looks like both are interested in pursuing anti-China policies. Trump has bragged about creating a tariff war, which he thinks would be beneficial for the United States. Uh, Harris has been... Key to, keen to reassert Biden's uh, diplomacy in terms of multiple coalitions and relationships. But I think one thing to, to anticipate over the next four years, and perhaps beyond, is that the United States continues its anti-China policy. And of course, this has ramifications throughout all aspects of, of the globe and, of course, domestically. Now, speaking of the globe, I, I think another trend or problematic that we want to keep in mind is that Globalization might be a turning point right now. That is, ever since 1990, the fall of the Soviet Union, we've seen globalization take off. And it's it, we all are very familiar with this. We've seen increased movement of capital across boundaries, to some extent population across national boundaries. We've seen all kinds of collaborations, the reduction of all kinds of boundaries, and so forth. The world is perhaps right now more globalized than it ever has been. Uh, this hasn't been without criticism and opposition. Um, right now, I think that Harris is likely to continue the Biden administration's globalization policy. And I characterize that as featuring the United States as kind of the global guardian or the global monitor, um, what one uh, military official once referred to as the sysadmin of the world, trying to keep global trade happening and uh, to you know, push aside actors that would, um, that would restrict it. Uh, and it's possible that Harris will keep doing that. Um, Trump, on the other hand, is famously very skeptical about alliances and agreements. He's very happy, as I said earlier, to go for tariffs, including on U.S. allies. So it's possible that we might see globalization fragment. We might see globalization start to come apart at the seams. We might see a kind of deglobalization. 
I'm not so sure about that, though, because I, I think we've also been seeing all kinds of non-US-centric attempts to build international collaboration. We have the BRICS, for example. We have the, uh, this, the Russian-Chinese alliance. Uh, we have China building its One Belt, One Road. Uh, we have Europe, which is you know, still the European Union, minus Britain, trying to act with its own autonomy. So we might see a real polycentric form of globalization. Uh, but I think we must also bear in mind you know, a popular dislike of globalization that plays out in all kinds of ways, uh, both culturally and also politically. Uh, so we might see some nations try to slow the roll of globalization. So uh, the next four years, I think we might see this really shift. A third topic, and it's probably larger uh, to think about, is what happens with climate change. Regardless of what the United States of America decides tonight, the climate crisis will continue to ratchet up for the next four years. Uh, you know, we have already a large amount of greenhouse gases baked into the atmosphere. Global warming is simply going to continue for the next four years with all of its attendant Earth system side effects from you know, storms, sea level rise, and all of this plus all the political, all the biological side effects. I mean, it's, that's simply baked in. That's just going to happen. The open question now, and this is not just a US question, this is also very much a European question. It's one that China is surfing in some interesting ways, is do we decide to continue and double down on the climate action that's characterized roughly in the last you know, 16 years of American politics off and on, uh, thinking about the Paris Agreement and Obama's participation in that, thinking about Biden's Inflation Reduction Act. Will we, in the United States, by electing Harris, turn to that, and will she keep on with that? Will we you know, continue to electrify the economy? Will we decarbonize? Will we try to do this with an attitude uh, and policy of climate justice? Will we build global organizations and agreements to continue to both do adaptation and mitigation? Will we look at carbon capture? I mean, that's one path forward, but the other path is one that seems to be very popular in Europe, or rising in popularity in Europe, and one that we see in the United States embodied by Trump and his support, which is the, the sense that climate change is either built in and we can't stop it, or that climate change is not a real problem, uh, that it's a problem for a century hence, and that what's more important now is to focus on improving or protecting our local economies. So that would mean doubling down on gas and coal and oil, for example. That would mean not supporting or subsidizing electric vehicles, electrification, and so on. Uh, that choice is one that the United States is embodying today to some extent. And it's a choice that's going to be made and remade across the world. Um, it's, it's possible that we will see our whole civilization unite around one of these choices, but I think it's less likely than that will occur. I think what's more likely is we'll see different nations making versions of this choice uh, opposed to each other and different nations then changing their minds again and again. So we might think of this as, for example, the sequence of uh, Obama uh, you know, supporting the Paris Agreement and then Trump pulling this out, Biden returning the U.S. to the Paris Agreement and passing the Inflation Reduction Act, and then Trump 2.0 you know, going against it and so on. But whatever we do, the climate crisis will continue to ratchet up. The one possible response to uh, the climate crisis is to really invest in technologies in different ways. And the technologies could be geoengineering, the technologies can be electric vehicles and new innovations in that respect, and they can be uh, all the technologies involved in resuscitating nuclear power, uh, carbon capture, and so on. And I think one of the interesting themes that this election embodies uh, points forward a bit is the idea of technological development continuing and also resistance to it. Um, I mean, that is, we keep seeing, you know, AI is continuing to develop, uh, not just a weekly or a daily basis, but an hourly basis. That's globally, right? You know, with nations around the world investing in this, with the U.S. in the lead for now. Uh, we're seeing robots continue to develop. I mean, not as quickly as, not as, quickly as AI, but they're still glumping along and we're seeing new developments in that. Um, we're especially seeing the, the new space race, which is something that 
really doesn't get enough attention, but now it's a complicated beast where we're seeing China, for example, rapidly launch a massive space enterprise very successfully, very impressively. We're seeing Elon Musk create this kind of Robert Heinlein-like private space enterprise that's you know enormously, enormously successful. We're seeing NASA continue to be the you know humanity's leader in deep space exploration. And we're seeing all kinds of countries and private actors get involved in this in various ways. Last week, India announced it was going to do another moon mission. We see private asteroid miners coming up. I mean, there, there's, there's a huge amount of, of space development going on. Uh, we're also seeing an awful lot of investment in biological research and development. I mean, everything from vaccines to uh, prosthetics to uh, old age treatments to life extension, bioinformatics, trying to do more to get technology into the human nervous system to get information out from that and to control it. Um, I think we're just likely to continue to see uh, continued technological development over the next four years with all the ripple effects uh, that we can think of but at the same time another trend continues and I think this may also be a bipartisan trend which is the backlash against Silicon Valley with the British press have called the tech lash and it's fascinating to think about this in a, in a, in a big picture sense because for a long time we had a lot of politicians actually supporting Silicon Valley. You know, the Obama administration was really close to it. You know, kind of revolving door between Google and the Obama administration. When she was Secretary of State under Obama, Hillary Clinton was very keen on using uh, digital technology, social media, mobile devices to try and spread democracy around the world. How, how things have changed. Now both Republicans and Democrats have really soured on the digital world for different reasons, and they want to cut it back in different ways. I mean, there is a kind of unanimity, a bipartisan agreement that screen time, whatever that might be, must be reduced for reasons that are still contested and by whatever means we can make it happen. Uh, we're seeing uh, in pop culture, we're seeing the tech bro is now a stock villain. Uh, we're seeing this in also bipartisan support for controlling digital content. And, and I'm not going to go into the different versions or, or implications of this right now, but just to think of content moderation or governments trying to encourage private actors to do certain things or outright censorship. And we're seeing both Republicans, Democrats, or at the very least progressives and, and conservatives supporting this, again, for different reasons. Um, I mean, political parties have different ways of tackling uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, you know, I think the Biden administration, for example, has pressured Silicon Valley very strongly. The AI Bill of Rights, trying to corral AI development, but also with uh, Lena Khan, who is trying to break up Google. Um, you know, on the conservative side, you see Musk trying to be this warrior for free speech while turning X to his, you know, to be his gigantic platform. Um, I, the key thing here is we've made a big turn against the digital world uh, and for all the hype we see for all the uh, fanfare for digital technologies the culture is very very different now uh, for years i've spoken about uh, the bootlerian jihad this is a creation of frank herbert it's part of the backstory for his great novel dune and uh, you know that is where humanity turns against the digital world specifically against uh, ai and this is something that he gets actually from 19th century fiction, uh, Samuel Butler's novel Erewhon and its preceding uh, work of fiction. And he, you know, this is an interesting vision. And when I started talking about this 20 years ago, people thought it was a bit crazy. But right now, I don't think we're expecting a bootlegging jihad over the next four years, but we can kind of see it from here. And what we're going to be doing is working through this tech lash. Now, speaking of, of backlash, I, I think one thing that we have to bear in mind is general, not just digital, but form of increasing dissent and unrest, what we might think of as ungovernability. Uh, we know that a lot of national elites in Europe, in China, in the U.S., in the Middle East are very uh, nervous about their populations becoming restive and harder to corral. Uh, they're worried about domestic unrest and violence of uh, revolution, depending on where you are in different ways, depending on which elite you're talking about. Um, in the U.S., there's been a lot of concern about a civil war. It's been hyped up, especially with a kind of frantic movie called Civil War, which is actually not really about a civil war, but that hasn't occurred. And various forms of civil unrest that I've been exploring and contemplating for you know, more than 12 years now, they haven't really occurred with the big exception of the January 6th riot. 
but it's clear that most of the us is politically very very divided and we're seeing that division sort out in different ways including geographically or people tend to you know people of a blue state persuasion tend to move to blue states and be in communities with fellow progressives and democrats and people of red state persuasions are more likely to move to red areas and so on um, and we're seeing the division play out in all kinds of ways it's not just you know trump fans versus the rest uh, we're seeing splits about gender, gender identity and gender roles, uh, splits about the nature of religion and it, what it does in society. Uh, we're seeing the appeal of the strong man or the strong woman, depending on where you are, as well as criticisms of that. Uh, we're all kinds of debate around climate change policies. Uh, I, I mentioned technology before, how we apprehend that. And of course, debates and splits about how to redress the historical and present echoes of racism and colonialism. Uh, I mean, all these are, are friction points, uh, areas where people within a given nation can, uh, can oppose each other and they might break out into various forms of dissent, including violence. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised over the next four years in the U.S. to see demonstrations, slacktivism, online you know, activism, but also targeted violence, uh, thinking, for example, about assassinations or people uh, demolishing certain physical sites. I uh, wouldn't be surprised to see more property damage, you know, from vandalism to, you know, along the power stations. And we could see tit-for-tat cycles of reciprocal violence like we saw, for example, in Italy and uh, in the 1960s and 70s or in Ireland during the Troubles. Um, we might see the creation of temporary autonomous zones as people try to withdraw from their their nation as it, it pursues a path they dislike. Uh, we might see medium-scale armed clashes, uh, depending again on the nation and, and, and its area. I started talking about the United States, but this is really something that we have to be concerned about in many, many countries. Um, one, one last thought, I'm going to just pull back a bit. Um, for a couple of years, I've been obsessed with an idea that I, I just can't shake. Uh, I'm writing about it a bit in my current book, um, Peak Higher Education, and it's the subject of the next book I'd like to write completely. Um, and that's what I've nicknamed internally the battle for the future, uh, or the argument for the future. And, and, and it, it goes like this. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how we're thinking about the next 100 or next 200 years. And, and this is not something I think that can be reduced to ideologies that we currently recognize, like capitalism or communism. Um, I think this is something deeper and stranger, yet it's one that already plays a role in our society. And it has to do with how we react to the past 200 years. So if I can really quickly, the past 200 years represent an extraordinary, literally extraordinary break in human history. Uh, starting, depending on how you measure this, somewhere between 1800 and at the latest 1870, uh, we rebooted civilization. Uh, we really took off in all kinds of measures. Lifespan, caloric intake, amount of education, total population, technological development, medical science, all kinds of metrics. We just shot off. I mean, it's a huge break from human history all the way back to the earliest history that we can track. And it's an extraordinary uh, change. And it's one that we now think about in some very, very opposed ways. And as we think about the future, our opposed ways of thinking about the industrial past shape which way we go. And these paths forward are diametrically opposite. And one of those paths uh, I've nicknamed the hypermodern path. And, and this is a, a way of thinking which says that the past 200 years is amazing. And we should celebrate that. We should grab onto it and go further. And we should try and aim for kind of Star Trek future, where humanity is in space, where humans have much longer lives, where we have you know intelligent AI as part of life. Maybe we have a post-capitalist economy or hyper-capitalist economy. We have more people. We are just you know we're closer and closer to godhood, uh, where humanity just becomes extraordinary and amazing. Uh, and the opposite idea is what my friend Ed Webb is referred to as the demodern idea. And this is the idea that says, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. This past 200 years, yes, has seen progress. In fact, that's where the idea of progress comes from. But we've also done horrible things to each other. I mean, you think about climate change, think about colonialism, think about racism, think about you know, uh, gender bias, all kinds of things. What we should do now is we should stop, we should hit pause, 
and fix all of these things now. That should be our priority. And, and the D-moderns really split into two groups. One part says, this is our choice. We know this now. We have this historical moment. We have this capacity. We should repair rather than expand. Uh, my friend Bill McKibben has this really fascinating book called Falter, where he says, you know, we've done tremendous work over the past 200 years, but right now we can, we're okay in terms of, of our progress. Now we can pause and we can fix what, climate ch what makes climate change happen. And we can try and also fix the devastation we've wrought to the environment. We can try and solve all kinds of problems and injustices. And that, that should be our priority now. And you can see this appearing in, in all kinds of places. But the other school of demoderns says that it's not our choice. It's too late. We will have no choice but to demodernize. Because we have exceeded, because of climate change, for example, is baked in vast and terrifying, perhaps because uh, we uh, have overshot planetary boundaries, perhaps because the human race right now is just at a, a point where it can no longer sustain itself. Uh, you think about books like Hospice and Modernity, where they argue that modernity itself is going to crash, and all we can do now is just slow, you know, reduce the damage as it goes down and try to prepare for a new or better time. And I, I think these demoderns and I think the hypermoderns are completely opposed to each other. And I think their struggle will define a lot of what we do in terms of politics, in terms of culture, in terms of personal life. When you think about everything from voluntary simplicity or degrowth economics, uh, you think about uh, tiny houses, for example, versus McMansions, I think we'll see more of this. I, I want to bring. I'll say more to this about this later on. Again, I'm talking about writing you know, book chapters and, and books about this. But I think right now we're starting to see hints of this in the U.S. election. We're starting to see some hypermoderns line up with Trump. So, for example, Elon Musk, who is kind of the, the poster child of this in some ways, uh, you know, who really wants to expand into space and so on. And he's clearly, you know, a big Trump fan. Uh, and we're seeing some demoderns line up with Democrats, and they're saying, again, this is where we get, you know, we need to do, uh, in the United States, for example, we need to, uh, we need to uh, have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission about slavery, and we need to, you know, assemble huge amounts of capital and give this to the descendants of slavery in order to try and balance that, you know, horrible social ill. Uh, I have a lot more to say about this. It, it, this. This hasn't fully come out in the open, but I think... We're seeing that choice play out to a degree in this election, and I think we should expect it to be a subject of conversation, policy making, and action over the next four years, although perhaps a bit under the surface. Um, I want to stop here because this is a lot to say. Uh, this is a lot to cover in, in just a short time. Um, and after all, it's been a very long day. Uh, it's almost 8 p.m. here on the east coast of the United States. Uh, I've been going for uh, uh, for a long time. Uh, biked nine hours, or sorry, nine uh, nine miles to the election and back. Um, helped teach a class. I mean, all kinds of things are going on here. But uh, what do you think about these these huge ideas? Are you seeing any of these big trends at work in the in the election, or are there others that you'd like me to think about, or that you'd like everybody else to be thinking about? Please leave comments. In the meantime, everybody in the United States, I hope you voted and are safe and sound. Good luck in the wild ride that we're on. And for everybody else in the world, uh, we're trying to do our best. I hope each of you is well. And I look forward to seeing you in the next vlog.